got it. Welcome. Welcome everyone to this second meeting of 2023 of the Socialist History Society. Uh, we run one or two meetings every month. Uh, uh, we, we try to do that. Most of them have been held online because uh, of the since COVID. We find that very convenient. But it, it allows people. It allows us to attract an international audience. So I'm sure we've got people from far afield listening in this evening to this fast. This what we hope, and I'm sure will be a fascinating talk on quite a controversial sub historical subject, uh, Zionism and its relationships. Uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about our speaker. He might be known to some of you. He might not be known to any of you. He might be known to some of you for the wrong reasons. So let me, uh, that's a, quite a possibility. So uh, it's Tony Greenstein. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing his name, but I, uh, it's, uh, it's as a, uh, He's been around for quite a few years uh, as an activist, and uh, I think I first uh, met him uh, in the 80s, when we were both very, very young, I hate <laughs> to add. Uh, but uh, our paths have not crossed much since then. Uh, we might have been in one party or, uh, 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 together uh, or at the same time, uh, and I think we're probably not in that party anymore, uh, uh, both of us. Uh, Tony has a... History, a master's degree in history from Birkbeck College, uh, a postgraduate law degree from Sussex University. Uh, he's written previously quite uh, uh, frequently in various publications on this, on the subject of uh, Zionism, uh, history of uh, uh, Israel, Israel's the settlements, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a subject of which he has uh, passionate and detailed uh, views and interesting views which we should debate in an open and honest way and this is what we're going to do tonight. He's a founder member of Britain's Palestine Solidarity Campaign I have here so that's uh, something to his credit as well, uh, an issue that's still unresolved. So this is a live issue uh, in, uh, to us as well as a historical issue uh, but tonight we'll be focusing on uh, on the historical aspects and Tony will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll open it up to a discussion. So without further ado, over to Tony. Thank you, Tony. Okay, thank you, David, uh, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm not quite sure which party we were both a member of. I've been a <laughs> member of... The International Socialists, way back when, in the early 1970s. And no, I wasn't in that. No, oh, right. I was, <laughs> and I was also, I, I think at about three different occasions, I was a member of the Labour Party. I was suspended once uh, and I was expelled once. So, uh, oh. Yeah, I resigned twice. Well, was that lately lapsed twice? <laughs> I, I resigned once, yes, uh, as well as that. Uh, but the, I've written this book, it's taken uh, the better part of a decade, uh, and it's called Zionism During the Holocaust. Now, why did I write it? The simple answer is because Zionism, the political movement Zionism, which was uh, formed at the end of the 19th century, uh, in the form of the Israeli state, as it's, uh, it now is, because Zion, the Zionist movement, its aim and its object was always to form uh, a Jewish state, uh, has exploited, besmirched, degraded and defiled the memory of those who died in the Holocaust in the service of the world's only apartheid state. And I, I don't think there's any doubt uh, in, in anyone's mind now that Israel is an apartheid state. Every single human rights organization of note from Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Israel's Beth Salem, uh, the Harvard Law Clinic, they've all come to the conclusion that Israel is an apartheid state and they've documented it very well. And yet Israel claims to represent the memory of those who died or, or rather the memory 
of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Uh, it, it isn't concerned with anyone else who has died. Uh, I think it's important, therefore, to, uh, if you like, deconstruct the history, to look at the history of what the Zionist movement actually did during the Holocaust, as opposed to what it claims to have done or what it claims to represent now. Uh, and that is extremely important because we know that today uh, the Holocaust is used by Israel's propagandists uh, for its own uh, purposes. Yet Israel is, let's face it, it's a state some of whose best friends are anti-Semites uh, and whose regime, the regimes like Viktor Orban in Hungary, the Argentinian Junta, which murdered up to 3,000 Jews in the 70s and 80s, uh, are vehemently uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, and that's no accident because Theodor Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, said in, wrote in his diaries uh, that the anti-Semitic countries will be our most dependable friends, uh, the anti-Semites will be our allies. Uh, and that's proved the case uh, ever since. Uh, if someone uh, tells me, in a, if I meet them in a bar and tells me to go back to Israel, they're either a Zionist or they're an anti-Semite, or they are both. And there's a long history of, of anti-Semitic support for Zionism. Uh, the main hero uh, of the Zionist movement was Arthur J. Balfour, uh, who was prime minister and then foreign secretary. Uh, and Balfour in 1905 uh, introduced uh, the Aliens Act, uh, specifically designed to keep Jewish refugees from Tsarist Russia out of Britain. But in 1917, of course, he put his name to the Balfour Declaration, which promised the land of the Palestinians to the Jewish people, or rather to the Zionist uh, movement. So I, I don't think there's any doubt about uh, the fact that Israel and the Zionist movement has exploited the Holocaust uh, and what has been called uh, the collective trauma, uh, and I'm quoting Owen Jones here, the collective trauma of the Jewish people. Let, let me just say uh, at the very start, I don't accept that term. Uh, I think it's really psychobabble. Individuals may suffer a trauma, but a, a people uh, suffering a collective trauma, I, I, I simply don't accept it. I mean, although people like Margaret Hodge, if you remember during the Corbyn era, uh, you never had a mention of Margaret Hodge without a reference to the fact that her relatives had died in the Holocaust. And I always wondered why, because there aren't many Jewish people who don't have uh, relatives who died in the Holocaust. I mean, my father's family who came from Poland, those who didn't leave in time died uh, in Treblinka or, or Auschwitz. So, I mean, it, it, that is very common, but uh, that doesn't therefore mean the Jewish people suffered a trauma. And certainly I didn't suffer a trauma because how can you suffer a trauma over people that, you've never met. They may have been your relatives, but uh, you never met them because in my case, they died before I was born. Uh, I, but I will tell you, I mean, uh, I did suffer a trauma when I went to Beirut uh, uh, as a uh, on a delegation to visit the PLO in 1979. I visited the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila. Uh, and I, I visited the uh, sewing camp uh, workshops that women were employed in. Uh, and I also took photographs of the children outside. Uh, and in 1982, when Israel's fascist friends, the Falange, entered the camp with the night sky being lit up by Israeli troops who prevented anyone escaping at the to the perimeter. Uh, and those troops savagely murdered maybe two to 3,000 people, including children. Almost certainly the children I met, I certainly did feel traumatized. But that episode, of course, has been forgotten along with the bloodbath uh, that Israel has caused uh, amongst the Palestinians to this very day. But the question 
remains is what is Zionism's record. And my book really is in two parts. It's, it's, its main title is Zionism during the Holocaust, although in fact, it's divided into three parts, before, during, and after the Holocaust. And secondly, it's subtitled, The Weaponization of Memory in the Service of State and Nation. And I'll try and concentrate on the latter part, but I do want to certainly mention the record of the Zionist movement during the Holocaust, because it's not one uh, that most people are aware of. You will remember that Ken Livingston touched uh, on aspects of that uh, when he said Hitler supported Zionism. And that was mistranslated by just about every newspaper into Hitler was a Zionist. And that, of course, was nonsense because uh, no one would know. Uh, he certainly wasn't a Zionist. Why would he be a Zionist? He, he was a national socialist. Uh, but nonetheless, Livingston had touched upon a very, very raw nerve of the Zionists, uh, and uh, he was demonized as a result. And I really want to quote here, uh, a critical, Zion critical Zionist historian called Noah Lucas, who was a lecturer at Sheffield University, he's now dead. Uh, and in his Modern History of Israel, which is a very good book, in fact, and I recommend it, uh, he wrote, quote, as the European Holocaust erupted, Ben-Gurion, ben -Gurion, David Ben-Gurion was the first prime minister uh, of Israel, but at the time of the Holocaust, he was the chairman of the World Zionist Organization. He was the key figure in the pre-state Israel, and for that matter, in uh, the po it, it, during the state itself. He was the second longest serving prime minister, but Netanyahu has now overtook overtaken him. Uh, and he wrote, as the European Holocaust erupted, Ben-Gurion saw it as a decisive opportunity for Zionism. In conditions of peace, Zionism could not move the masses of world Jewry. The forces unleashed by Hitler, in all of their horror, must be harnessed to the advantage of Zionism. By the end of 1942, the struggle for a Jewish state became the primary concern of the movement. Uh, and that is really something which is accepted by most serious historians as opposed to propagandists. Uh, and I want to quote uh, Ben-Gurion himself. And I'm quoting from uh, primarily from the official biography of Ben-Gurion by Shabtai Tebeth, it's The Burning Ground, 1886 to 1948. And the title of the chapter is Disaster Means Strength. It's the very last chapter of the book. Uh, and I, I quote, uh, this is on page 853, but I won't give you footnotes all the time because it will take up time. And he said, disaster is strength if channeled to a productive course. The whole trick of Zionism is that it knows how to channel our disaster, not into despondency or degradation, as is the case in the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, but into a source of creativity and exploitation. And this was in October 1941, when the Holocaust was already underway. Uh, if you, you remember or you know your history, really the Holocaust started in June, I think it was June the 22nd with Operation Barbarossa uh, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. And behind the German army, the Einsatzgruppen, uh, the killing squads, there were four of them, uh, only comprising about 3,000 men. They eliminated, wiped out every single Jew they could find. At first it was just the men, but uh, by the September, of 1941, it was women and children uh, as well. So in October 1941, Ben-Gurion, so, as I said, saw the disaster as something that could be exploited. Uh, 
And if I go on, he said, to the disaster of German Jewry, we must offer a Zionist response. This was within November 1935, uh, at the time just after the Nuremberg Laws. Namely, we must convert the disaster that was be had befallen German Jewry into a source for the upbuilding of Palestine. So he was quite clear that the main task at that time was not the rescue of refugees or anything else. It was the upbuilding of Palestine. And he explained his thinking, uh, and this was in January 1933, uh, when, if you remember, Hitler had first assumed power. When he said Zionism is not primarily engaged in saving individuals, and that if there was a conflict of interest between saving individual Jews and the good of the Zionist enterprise, we shall say the Zionist enterprise, the enterprise comes first. So Ben Gurion was really absolutely clear as to what the tasks were. And the Zionist, in a sense, when when the when Hitler assumed power in January 1933, you'll remember he was really put into power uh, after pressure from the industrialists and the military in Germany, uh, and Hindenburg acceded to that. The bourgeois, if you like, leaders of the conservative parties believed that they could control Hitler, uh, and von Papen uh, was the vice chancellor. The Jewish people all over the world reacted with absolute horror, uh, and they immediately mounted a boycott of Nazi Germany, uh, which was very effective. Uh, it, it certainly panicked the Nazi leaders, who summoned the leaders of German Jewry uh, to a meeting with Goring in order to try and get them to call off uh, uh, the boycott. But the Zionists, and the Zionists alone, saw the ascendancy, the rise of the Nazis, not as a disaster, not as a terrible tragedy in the making, but really as a golden opportunity. Francis Nicosia, who's written two books, he, he is a Zionist supporter. Uh, he's uh, the professor of Holocaust studies at Vermont University, the Raoul Hilberg uh, professor uh, of Holocaust studies, spoke of the illusory assumption, quote unquote, that Zionism, quote, must have been well served by a Nazi victory, unquote. Hitler's victory could only, quote, bolster Zionist fortunes. And he spoke of the tendency to, quote, view Zionist interests as distinct from those of the larger Jewish community in the diaspora. Uh, and he went on to say, so positive was its assessment of the situation, that's the Zionist movement, the Zionist leadership's assessment of the situation, that as early as April 19, 1933, the German Zionist Federation announced its determination to take advantage of the crisis to win over the traditionally assimilationist German jury to Zionism. Because I, uh, if I just stop here uh, and uh, explain that Ge German jury, which was about half a million strong, was overwhelmingly non or anti Zionist. Just 2% of German Jews supported the German Zionist Federation. And that was that was not unusual. Uh, there was virtually no country where Jews uh, were strong or had large communities where the Zionists were in a minority. And that includes Britain, for example. The Zionists only captured the board of deputies in 1940. Uh, I won't go into why uh, that was the case and how it was the case, but uh, say in Britain, in America, and throughout Europe, uh, that was the same. In fact, the place where the Zionists had had the biggest base uh, was in Poland, where which was, if you like, the uh, had the most Jews in Europe, 3.3 million uh, Jews. And in the 1920s, uh, there's no doubt that the Zionists did have a base, but that base was eroded for the very simple reason that all Zionism had to offer was the illusion 
of safety in Palestine, because Palestine was certainly not capable or able or even desirous of accommodating or accepting Jewish refugees. They wanted young pioneers for the settlements, not the old, not the frail, not the disabled, and so on. And in Poland, uh, the major party of the Jewry, of Polish Jewry was the anti-Zionist Bund, the General Jewish Workers' Union uh, of Poland, uh, Lithuania and Russia. And in 1938, in the last three elections in Poland, the local authority elections, in Warsaw, there were 20 Jewish council seats. And out of that 20, the Bund won 17. The Zionists won one. And two went to uh, other parties or other groups, uh, religious, the Agudat, uh, Yisrael. And that was repeated throughout Poland. The Bund, which was in alliance with the Polish Socialist Party, won majorities in virtually every big concentration of Jews, like Lodz, for example, which is the second major city uh, of Jews. So, I mean, Zionism had no answers. Uh, and, and Isaac Deutscher, if I can find the quotes, explained this very well. Uh, people will know uh, Deutscher, the biographer uh, of Leon Trotsky, he wrote, to the Jewish workers, anti-Semitism seemed to triumph in anti-Semitism, which recognized the legitimacy and the validity of the old cry, Jews get out. The Zionists were agreeing to get out. So, I mean, the anti-Semites wanted Jews to leave and the Zionists said, yes, I mean, we have no problem with that. But as, as I say, if I go back to uh, the Zionist reaction to the rise of Hitler, it was they were the only section of world Jewry which saw something positive in the rise of the Nazis. For example, Berl Katznelson, who was a founder of Mapai, that's uh, the Workers' Party of, of the Land of Israel, it, in other words, the Israeli Labour Party as it became, or the Israeli Labour Alignment, and the editor of their paper, Davar, as well as Ben-Gurion's effective deputy, saw the rise of Hitler and asked, quote, an opportunity to build and flourish like none we have ever had or ever will have. Uh, and that comes from Tom Segev's Seventh Million. But as I say, uh, if you uh, have a copy of my book, uh, you'll find all the footnotes for these. Ben-Gurion himself was even more optimistic. The Nazis' victory would become a fertile force for Zionism. And one of the leaders, the major leaders of German jury, Rabbi Joachim Prinz, who later became deputy uh, chair of the World Jewish Congress, and president of the American Jewish Congress because he emigrated to the United States. He admitted that it was morally, quote, it was morally disturbing to seem to be considered as the favored children of the Nazi government, particularly when it dissolved the anti-Zionist youth groups and seemed in other ways to prefer the Zionists. The Nazis asked for a more Zionist behavior. I mean, others were more effusive. Uh, I read, uh, and I quote uh, in my book, uh, a PhD thesis by Etan Bloom from Tel Aviv University on Arthur Rupin. Arthur Rupin ran the Palestine office from 1907, and he was a second major figure in the, the pre-state, uh, if you like, uh, yeshuv, as it's called, the Jewish community. And Bloom, uh, I say his thesis was on uh, Arthur Rupin, but in it, uh, Rupin himself was a, 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 an ardent believer in the racial sciences. Uh, he, he had a famous meeting uh, with Hans Gunther in 1933 uh, at Jena University. Uh, he was the, uh, really the ideological mentor of Heinrich Himmler. Uh, he was appointed to Jena University on the insistence uh, of the Nazis, because they, they 
obtained their first state ministers uh, in uh, in that state uh, where Jenner is situated. Bloom quotes Emma Ludwig, the world famous biographer, who expressed the general attitude of the Zionist movement. And his quote was this, Hitler will be forgotten in a few years, but he will have a beautiful monument in Palestine. You know, the coming of the Nazis was rather a welcome thing. Thousands who seemed to be completely lost to Judaism were brought back to the fold by Hitler. And for that, I am personally very grateful to him. Uh, the Zionist national poet, Nachman Bialik, uh, volunteered that, quote, Hitlerism has, has perhaps saved German Jewry which was being assimilated into annihilation. And even today, you find uh, many Zionists who compare assimilation, that is the loss of someone from the Jewish uh, people or nation, race, or however you want to term it, uh, and annihilation. And of course, German, Jew, Germany's remaining Jews were of course annihilated, but uh, it wasn't by assimilation. And Ben Gurion's uh, own biographer, uh, Shabtai Teve, reached the con concluded uh, in his, in the biography, and I, I quote: "If there was a line in Ben Gurion's mind between the beneficial disaster and an all-destroying catastrophe, it must have been a very fine one." Unquote. I mean, Tavith says the official biographer of David Ben Gurion. Most of his book is a hagiography, in my opinion. Uh, he is an ardent Zionist, but nonetheless, he concluded that for Ben Gurion, the rise of the Nazis was a good thing insofar as it gave critical mass to the upcoming Jewish state. Uh, because uh, there was something like 200,000 people who immigrated to the issue of to Palestine in the 1930s. And that was because of Hitler. I mean, I mean, we often hear uh, the Zionist myth of that for 2000 years, the Jews have longed for nothing but uh, to reestablish their state, to go back to Palestine. But I say, this is, a, this is an entire myth it's complete nonsense, because if that was the case, then why did they wait 1900 years before they went back? I mean, there was nothing to stop them. There was no immigration borders. There was no passport. The Ottoman Empire did not stop people going. And yet between 1850 uh, and 1914, in the middle of the 19th century uh, and the beginning of the First World War, something like two and a half million Russian and Polish Jews did emigrate because of anti-Semitism, the pogroms, which killed thousands of Jews, and the general economic pauperization that they, they underwent. And yet 99% of them went to either the United States or Britain or other countries. Just 1% went to Palestine. There was nothing ever to stop them. Uh, and the only conclusion you can reach is that most Jews would go anywhere but Palestine. Uh, and this was why, I mean, in the 1960s and 70s, some of you may remember the campaign for Soviet Jewry uh, with all the uh, accoutrements that the Zionist movement could muster, demonstrations, disruption of theatre uh, plays and so on and so forth. But what you probably wouldn't uh, have known is that the Zionists, the Zionist movement fought time and time again to stop Soviet Jews having left the Soviet Union going to the United States. Menachem Begin flew over to plead with Ronald Reagan not to allow them in. I mean, and uh, uh, the foreign minister flew to Germany to do likewise, and uh, in Germany, they refused to accede because they wanted Jews to come in, uh, if you like. It, it gave them a sort of moral credibility after what had happened. But in America, in the end, I mean, the barriers were raised. 
the Zionists also uh, lobbied vehemently Jewish non-Zionist Jewish refugee organizations not to give any aid to what they call dropouts. In other words, people who really did not want to go to Israel when uh, the United States was so fo- so much more alluring. Uh, organizations like the Hebrew Hias, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, uh, and also the Joint Distribution Committee, which was the major Jewish refugee organization during the war. Uh, and I want to, I mean, if I can sum up really, uh, the Zionist attitude. And I, I, I'm gonna uh, share my screen because I actually want you to see uh, this. It's from Boaz Evron. He, he was an Israeli journalist. Can everyone see it on your screen? <laughs> Yeah, that's showing, no problem. Okay, good. This is from the Jewish state or the Israeli nation. Boaz Evron was a journalist on the Idiot Achronot, which was the biggest circulation Hebrew paper in Israel. And he was someone who was called uh, a Canaanite. If I can just explain, there were these groups of people, uh, a minority, but uh, nonetheless... Uh, quite an influential minority. Yuri Avneri, who people may have heard of, was another of these. They were called Canaanites because they believed that Israel should separate itself off from the Jewish diaspora and become a state, not of the Jewish nation, this mythical Jewish nation, but actually a state of its own citizens. But of course, to this day, Israel is a state of its Jewish citizens and uh, allegedly the Jewish people, though that is really a metaphysical nonsense. Uh, and uh, Boaz Evron quotes from a letter by George Landau, who was became the director of the uh, Zionist uh, settlement agency for Ju- uh, German Jewry, to Stephen Wise, who was the leader of American Zionism. And this was dated February the 13th, 1938. If I can give you just a background to this, this was concerning the Evion conference, which was going to be held in July 1938. Because of the growing Jewish refugee situation and problem, uh, not yeah, Roosevelt had called a conference of uh, 31 nations, which is going to be held in the spa town of Evion in France. I mean, it was in many ways a face-saving exercise because it was called on the basis that uh, no nation, no state that attended would have to change its refugee policy. But the Zionists were extremely worried. uh, And Landor wrote to Stephen Weiss saying, I'm writing this letter at the request of Dr. Weizmann, Chaim Weizmann. He was the first president of the Israeli state and he was the longtime president of the World Zionist Organization. I'm writing this letter at the bequest of Dr. Weizmann because we're extremely concerned lest the problem, that is the problem of Jewish refugees, be presented in a way which could prejudice the activity for Eretz Israel, that's the land of Israel. Even if the conference does not propose immediately after its opening other countries but Eretz Israel, as venues for Jewish emigration, it will certainly arouse a public response that could put the importance of Eretz Yisrael in the shade. We are particularly worried that it would move Jewish organizations to collect large sums of money for aid to Jewish refugees, and these collections could interfere with our own, with our collection efforts. There is also, he went on, a statement by Menachem Asishkin, who was a leading Russian Zionist in a meeting of the Jewish agency executive. The Jewish agency was the quasi-Zionist government in the making uh, before the Israeli state was formed on June the 26th, 1938. That is just a month before the start of the conference. And he, uh, and he says, he is highly concerned at the Avion conference. Mr. Greenbaum is right. He's another member of the Zionist of the Jewish agency executive. Mr. Greenbaum is right in stating 
that there is a danger that the Jewish people also will take Eretz Yisrael off its agenda, and this should be viewed by us as a terrible danger. He hoped to hear in Evion that Eretz Yisrael remains the main venue for Jewish immigration. Emigration, rather. All other emigration countries do not interest him. The greatest danger is that attempts will be made to find other territories for Jewish emigration. I mean, I mean, in many ways, I mean, this is unbelievable because here you have half a million German Jews. Uh, the, vast, the majority of German Jews had not yet emigrated. They were after the Kristallnacht uh, to flood out, although it was extremely difficult. But here is the Zionist, the leaders of the Zionist movement saying that attempts to find other territories for these Jews and would, of course, be other Jews who fell in the Nazi net was a great danger. And, the, and he goes on, and the account of Ben-Gurion's statement at the meeting was, no rationalizations can turn the conference from a harmful to a useful one. What can and should be done is to limit the damage as far as possible. He doesn't know, quote, whether the Evian conference will open the gates of other countries to Jewish immigration. But like Greenbaum and Asishkin, he fears that, is, uh, that at this time, the conference is liable to cause immense harm to Eretz Yisrael and Zionism. It was summed up in the meeting that the Zionist thing to do is, quote, to belittle the conference as far as possible and to cause it to decide nothing, unquote. Uh, and this was uh, the Zionist policy. Throughout the Holocaust, whenever attempts were made to find a refuge for Jewish refugees other than Palestine, the Zionist movement moved to try and close it down. Uh, and this is well documented in my book. And I, I actually have some documents which are reprinted in my book, uh, which uh, confirm this. But the, the second, I want to move on really. Uh, the second part of my book is about the weaponization of memory. Uh, and what I want to ask is how is one of the greatest crimes in history because the Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust was a great crime uh, uh, and it didn't just include Jews. If you remember, it's arguable, Henry Friedlander, the origins of the Nazi genocide, uh, a, Jewish, uh, a Jewish historian, but not a Zionist, uh, argues that the Holocaust actually began in October 1939 uh, with the euthanasia so-called campaign in Germany itself. People may recall that Hitler had decided that useless eaters, that is the mentally and the physically handicapped, would also be exterminated. Uh, and they were uh, something like 100,000 in Germany before there was such an outcry that Bishop Garland of Munster, the Bishop of Munster, uh, denounced what was happening from the pulpit uh, in, the, I think it was September 1941, and Hitler was forced to call, us a, call an end to it, at least officially, but it, it went on in the concentration camps, which is where mentally and physically handicapped people went. But it's arguable that that was really the beginning of the Holocaust. And in fact, the gas trucks, because uh, disabled and mentally handicapped people were pushed into the back, were kept in the back of these gas trucks. They went into, uh, they were sealed and the carbon monoxide from the uh, exhaust was pumped into the back as they went into the woods. And then after half an hour, the doors were open and then uh, all those inside uh, died. These very same gas trucks went to Poland to actually open the first extermination camp, Chelmno, on December the 4th, 1941. So you can actually see the, the clear connections. And Christian Wirth, who was the uh, commandant of one of the six killing centres in Germany, uh, became, uh, again, the commandant of Treblinka, and in fact, the inspector general of the Action Reinhardt extermination camps in Poland. There were, I think, four of them, uh, Sobibor, Treblinka, Auschwitz uh, and Belzec. 
uh, and also later on Majdanek uh, in Lublin, Poland. Uh, so there, was, there were very clear connections, but also, uh, I mean, it wasn't just uh, the disabled, although it's rarely mentioned on the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust site, uh, which talks about the Holocaust, it talks about the Holocaust solely in terms of the Jews. Yet an equal victim were the gypsies, uh, up to a million, I am told, were exterminated in the concentration camps. Uh, we have a meeting next week with a, an expert on the, the, the gypsy holocaust and it's believed that about a million uh, were killed and we, we rarely hear anything of it. Yad Vashem, which is the Israeli Holocaust Memorial Museum, makes no mention. The US Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum makes very little mention of it either. Uh, and of course, gays were exterminated. Uh, uh, Russian prisoners of war, three million were exterminated. And in fact, in Poland, uh, in the first two years under Operation Tannenberg, more Jews died because they were members of the Polish intelligentsia than, than because they were Jews. Uh, the Nazis, when they went into Poland, were determined to make it a slave nation, and they went about exterminating the intelligentsia. And of course, Jews were well represented in the intelligentsia. But today, we see both Israel and imperialism generally uh, using the Holocaust, if you like, to uh, reinforce its moral legitimacy. Uh, and if you watch uh, TV programs and read books, you would really think in many ways that the, world war, the war was fought in order to try and rescue the Jews or prevent the Holocaust. But at the time, of course, the Allies uh, were simply not interested. Uh, in what was happening. Uh, we know for a fact that Bletchley Park, uh, the internal communications between the concentration camps were cracked very early, uh, but none of that information was released. Uh, I, I want to quote from Yitzhak Laor. It's a book, uh, The Myths of Liberal Zionism. He is the most famous Israeli poet and he's uh, an activist uh, and a novelist as well. And he said, why now? Why now the contemporary concern with the Jewish genocide, nearly half a century after it took place, compared to its treatment immediately after the Second World War? And then he also asked, why the commemoration, why the museums and so on, to commemorate the Holocaust in America? Because I, I went uh, to the US Holocaust Museum uh, in Washington very soon after it opened. Uh, 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 there was no mention of uh, the US immigration quotas that kept out hundreds of thousands of Jews who wanted to come and would have survived if, if that had been, uh, been the case. I saw on the wall the, fa the very famous uh, saying by Pastor Niemöller, first they came for the communists and then they came for the Jews, etc. But of course, because this uh, takes place in the in the midst of the Cold War, as it were, there was no mention of the communists. They had been excised from Pastor Niemöller's statement, which greets you as you come into the museum, uh, incidentally. And, and we're all asked why there is no international day to mark the extermination of Native American Native Americans or the slave trade, uh, despite. Uh, the United States' heavy involvement uh, in the slave trade. And he, he goes on to say, the genocide and the Jews served in the construction of a European identity. And if I go on... Uh, to the end of this chapter, he says, this is not the commemoration and the memorialization of the Holocaust is not really about perpetuating the memory of the genocide, but about consolidating a new ideology of, the, of exclusion. Now it is the Jews and the insiders. What our leaders asked for, it seems, was not the rights of man, but the right to belong to the elite. We can now participate in violating the rights of others. 
And of course, uh, today, every European state wants to uh, remember the Holocaust. And uh, possibly the most ludicrous attempt is uh, in Hungary itself. Uh, people will be aware uh, Viktor Orban, who won an election campaign on the basis of a uh, demonization of George Soros, who he, he damned as an international speculator who owed no loyalty to any nation. But Viktor Orban, too, uh, has uh, tried to set up a new uh, Holocaust museum. It's called the House of Fates. It hasn't yet opened because he's had problems because he wants to reconstruct Hungarian uh, history. Uh, for those who don't know, in Hungary, Hungary was the last major Jewish community to, uh, to survive uh, until the Nazis invaded in March 1933. And because of uh, certain factors, not least the collaboration of the Zionists there, between March the 15th, 1930, uh, 1944, and July 7th, when Admiral Horthy, the ruler of uh, Hungary, called a halt, uh, nearly half a million Jews. Uh, were exterminated. Uh, and Orban has called uh, Horthy an exceptional statesman, despite the fact that Horthy presided over the deportation of the Jews. He could have stopped it at any time, and he was fully aware of where, where the deportation trains were going. But it's not just in Hungary, for example, in Poland too. Uh, there was quite massive collaboration, especially by the Polish uh, police uh, with the Nazis. But it is now a, a, a crime, although it's been relegated to a civil offence, but there's still punishments if you infringe the Holocaust law, to say that any Poles participated or collaborated with the Nazis in the, in the uh, perpetration of the Holocaust. So the question I ask, really, is what are the real lessons of the Holocaust? And I, th I think it's really quite clear that uh, racism should be opposed and ethnic cleansing should be opposed wherever it occurred. Let us remember that the program of the Nazis when they came to power was not at first extermination. That took place from 1941 onwards uh, as regards the Jews. Uh, it was expulsion. Uh, the Nazis tried to expel as many Jews as possible. Uh, and we know that uh, when the Jewish state, Israel, was set up, the first thing it did, even before it was set up, was the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. Uh, because we, how, how could you have a Jewish state when, a, when the majority of its uh, inhabitants, residents, uh, were not Jewish? Uh, but for Israel... Universalization, and I'm quoting from Peter Novick's uh, The Holocaust in, Mem in uh, American Life, the universalization meant a plunder of Jewish moral capital. Uh, and he, he is quoting uh, from the spokespersons for the American Jewish Congress. Gerhard Riegner, who was the representative of the World Jewish Congress in Geneva uh, during the war, uh, called the Holocaust an important political asset. And this, is, this has been the Zionist attitude throughout. Uh, and Israel, every year, least until COVID, I'm not sure what the situation is now, but until COVID, it sent thousands of children, school children, to visit Auschwitz each year. And they dressed, they wrapped themselves up in the Israeli flag, and they marched from Auschwitz to Birkenau. But what did they do? I mean, uh, uh, they didn't learn the lessons of Auschwitz that racism was wrong, whoever it is perpetrated against. Uh, the lessons they learned was that Jews uh, had to be strong. In other words, never again meant never again for the Jews, not never again uh, for any people. You must tell me if I'm going on too long, because I, I, I will stop. Uh, 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 David, I can't hear you. I know I'm not mute, I'm muted. Uh, I think if you could do a two minute summary and then we'll go to yes. questions because it's getting okay. Really I, I will do it. I, I want to quote, uh, sorry, I, I have gone on long. Uh, I want to quote from Gideon Levy, who uh, 
for people who uh, may know is a columnist and associate editor of Haaretz, which is a liberal Zionist newspaper in Israel. And he wrote in his column, I have yet to hear a single teenager come back from Auschwitz and say that we mustn't abuse others the way we were abused. There has yet to be a school whose pupils came back from Birkenau straight to the Gaza border, saw the barbed wire fence and said never again. The message is always the opposite. Gaza is permitted because of Auschwitz. Uh, I, I think people should bear in mind Israel's interpretation and the lessons it draws from the Holocaust is that because we were killed, because we were murdered, therefore others uh, were entitled to inflict the same fate on others. And I will just leave you really with this one quote. And again, it's from David Ben-Gurion. After, after Kristallnacht in November 1938, Britain agreed at the urging uh, of uh, Britain's Jewish leaders to admit 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, the kinder transports, many of you I'm sure will know. And the Zionists were absolutely furious because they weren't gonna go to Palestine. And Ben-Gurion in the speech the Mapai Central Committee on the 9th of December 1938, that's a month after Kristallnacht, he, he uh, said, if I knew that it would be possible to save all the children in Germany by bringing them over to England and only half of them by transporting them to Eretz Yisrael, then I would opt for the second alternative. For we must weigh not only the life of these children, but also the history of the people of Israel. That's... Uh, in Ben Gurion's bi biography, which I've mentioned, it's in many other books, uh, and no one has ever denied the validity uh, of that uh, uh, quote. But that was the attitude of the Zionists. What mattered most was the building of a Jewish state. When the choice came between the Jews and the Jewish state, then the Jewish state uh, came first. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry if I've gone on a bit long, but I'll take as many questions as uh, you can ask. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. It was at, uh, at least a very stimulating uh, uh, talk. Thank you for that. Uh, it's uh, raised a few questions which people might want to uh, comment on or elaborate on or uh, respond to. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, I've, I've, I've learned a bit through it. So what we'll do, we'll uh, get people to raise their little hands. Uh, there's a mechanism down there. You can do that. And I'll, I'll feel... Do you want to take one at a time or, or one or two? I'm quite happy to take two yeah. or three at a time if you want. I think we might take two or three at a time, if, if there's a lot yeah. or two at a time. Uh, and uh, then we'll uh, I'll bring in uh, people uh, as we go along. Uh, I mean, personally, I haven't read the book, but I, I, I do quite, I'm quite interested in getting a copy now. Um, <clears throat> it's not a subject I'm an expert in. I do understand, though, I mean, if I can raise a question, first of all, that du during the period from 1945 to the, uh, 1990, the Germany was divided into two states, and quite a bit of work was done by historians and researchers of the GDR into the, into the, the question of, uh, of, of Nazism and uh, Zionism. Uh, I'm just researching the other day uh, about for, for the, in preparation to this meeting. I found a fascinating article from the GDR. It's in English. It's online uh, by someone called Klaus Polkine. Yeah, I know. You probably know it's Zionism and Nazi Germany. And it, it's got there's quite a lot of facts in there, quite a useful, useful facts in there. And you can find it easily online called The Secret Contact, Zionism and Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1941. It's about the early history of the uh, Nazi party and its and the, how Zionism responded to it. And it's very, very interesting. He quotes people like Christopher Sykes, who's a British historian from the 60s, saying that uh, the uh, Zionist leaders were determined at the very outset to reap the political advantages of the tragedy 
emerging of the rise of Nazism. Anyway, I'll pass over. I've got three people I can see there. Uh, I, I think I'll bring in uh, Steve's. Uh, I'll bring in Steve second because he's a he's a, he's our. I don't want to be accused of favoritism. I'll bring in Spearos first. If you want to unmute yourself, Spearos, and ask your question and make your comments. Don't be too long, please. But the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys, and especially Tony Greenstein for his excellent delivery. My name is Piros Macris. Uh, I'm a visiting research fellow uh, at the University of Sussex, Tony. In, oh, right. In, yes. So it's it's very nice to, to see you there. You can only see the top of your head. I, I, li I like Brighton so very much. So uh, I'm an expert on, on, Hannah, on Hannah Arendt's uh, work. Yes, so yes. it doesn't surprise me, your, your excellent delivery. Uh, at all, because uh, you know, I hope the other guys there that Hannah Arendt uh, uh, has the same perspective uh, in in her in her work uh, throughout her life. So, for this reason, she was a persona non grata, so to speak, in, in the state of Israel. So, my question is twofold, uh, uh, Tony. Uh, first of all, I, I want to know if, according to your perspective, we can uh, define uh, political Zionism as a kind of Jewish nationalism, the first part. And the second one, uh, which is a kind of, uh, of, 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 of the same question in, uh, in different terms, uh, let's say, uh, if, if, if you think that um, um, this is a, a kind of, uh, uh, of um, of a political realism uh, when it comes to to the state of, of Israel, and if I may, a, a third part, uh, I would like to know your 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 opinion uh, when it comes to the difference between political Zionism and cultural Zionism, which is very critical for me when it comes to the interwar period, especially in in Germany and. Not only in Germany, but uh, in Germany, uh, of course. So that's all for me. Uh, thanks a lot for this, Tony, and uh, it's nice to, to to meet you and the other guys, of course. Thanks a lot. Okay, we'll take. Uh, I think we'll take Steve before uh, I'll ask uh, Tony to respond. If that's all right, Steve, do you want to spit out your question now? Uh, yes. Uh, two possibly slightly technical question, historical questions. Uh, Firstly, uh, uh, I'm interested in the Zionist reaction in the resistance, uh, and particularly Hashem uh, Hetzer, because in the in the West, in France and in Belgium, uh, they didn't do anything. They they basically sat on their hands, and those uh, Zionists in the West who wanted to fight, uh, people like Abraham Leon joined the Trotskyists, uh, uh, Herbert Hertz while well, Romania Zionists actually joined the, joined the communist resistance in France uh, and so on. Uh, whereas in the East, uh, people like Mordecai Tannenbaum and the like uh, actually took up arms uh, 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 against, the, uh, 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 against the German occupation. Uh, so I just wonder if you have any views about why there was that difference between uh, 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 the Zionist reaction in, in, in the East and, and, and in the West. And secondly, I read somewhere that you disagreed with Lenny Brenner's uh, uh, interpretation in uh, Zionism and the Age of the Dictators. Uh, uh, but I can't find where you wrote it now. So uh, uh, do you disagree with Lenny Brenner's uh, 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 analysis or not? Uh, and if so, why? because it's such a long time since I've read it that I can't remember uh, why you might agree or disagree. Thanks very much. Okay, Tony, you can respond to both those uh, comments now. Yes, okay. Uh, well, first, Spiros, hello. Uh, if you didn't know already, I, I also live in Brighton, so uh, we, we must meet up for a coffee or something. Uh, you asked me, is Zionism a form of Jewish nationalism? It's a good question. 
I, I make a distinction between groups which are nationalist and which are national movements. The Nazis were a nationalist movement, but they weren't a German national movement at all. I mean, they were a fascist uh, movement. Mm -hmm. And Zionism similarly, if anything, uh, the Jewish national movement in Eastern Europe was the bond that the, the, they... The, the, they spoke the language, Yiddish. The Zionists hated Yiddish. Uh, they were they represented the majority of Jewish workers. Uh, they were they they were indeed in many ways a, a national movement. They called for national cultural autonomy. The Zionists, on the other hand, uh, were were in many ways from the start a settler colonial movement. Uh, they, they weren't uh, trying to establish uh, a Jewish state in Europe. Uh, they wanted to establish a, a settler colony in Palestine. So my answer is, it was not a national movement. And then you ask the, the differences between the political and the cultural Zionism. Yes, I mean, a lot is made of cultural Zionism. But it was a very, very weak movement. Its main, its main adherent was Echad Ha'am, or Asher Ginsburg, uh, who went to Palestine and he helped form the Hebrew University. And Jude Magnus was another, and Martin Buber, I think, was also. But these were just a handful of the Zionist intellectuals. I mean, Echad Ha'am didn't uh, believe in the Jewish states. He believed that Palestine should be a, a cultural center. Uh, and they had absolutely no effect uh, on the Zionist movement. Uh, and there was no possibility that they could have had an effect. Uh, because although the Zionist movement in 1927, when Eichan Ham died, did not call for a Jewish state openly, because, you know, that, that would have aroused the wrath of the Arabs and the British would have told them to shut up, which they actually did. Uh, of course, that was their goal and their desire from the start. I mean, Herzl, when he wrote his pamphlet, the Judenstadt, the state of the Jews or the Jewish state, that was in 1896, uh, the very foundation of Zionism. So I would say that cultural Zionism was a very interesting phenomena, but it was really confined to, to just a handful of intellectuals. I mean, Eichard, uh, Judah Magnus, who was the president, the first president of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, was uh, virtually thrown out of Palestine because he opposed the formation uh, of a Jewish state and he spoke against it, as did, incidentally, Albert Einstein, uh, who's, who the Zionists always claim as an adherent. But Einstein said that uh, the idea of a Jewish state is anathema to the very concept of Judaism and it will destroy it. Uh, and that was very much the position of Hannah Arendt as well. Uh, and then you mentioned, was it you, Steve, or was it you? I, I can't remember. No, it was you who mentioned Hannah Arendt. Ha I mean, Hannah Arendt is uh, one of my uh, favourite uh, people, mm. uh, one of my favourite writers, although I, I don't agree with her uh, on many things. I, I think she's a wonderful writer. And, uh, and uh, when she when she brought out her book, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, for those who don't know, the Eichmann trial was held in, in 1961 when Israel captured Eichmann. Uh, and the reason for this primarily, because I, I didn't have time to go into it, but after the war, after the Holocaust, Israel really did not want to know about the Holocaust. Uh, out of uh, in its first history textbook uh, that was issued in Israel, just one page was devoted to the Holocaust compared to 10 pages for the Napoleonic Wars. So that gives you some idea uh, of its importance. And the reason why it was quite simple, the Zionists thought we're creating a new young nation state of people who are fighters. And our ideal is Masada the desert fortress where I think in 70 AD, uh, the zealots, the Sikari zealots uh, committed, this is, it may not be true, it may be a myth, but uh, rather than surrender to the Romans, they committed collective suicide. This was the ideal. Whereas 
those who died in the Holocaust went like sheep to the slaughter, to quote Gideon Hausner, the prosecutor in the Eichmann trial. So Israelis didn't want to know about the Holocaust. They wanted to forget it, to put it aside. That was the diaspora, the hated diaspora, because Zionism really hated uh, the whole idea of a diaspora. And indeed, if you... Uh, if, if you hear some of the things that were said about uh, the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora by Zionists, you would think that you were listening to anti-Semites. For example, Pinchas Rosenblatt, uh, the first Israeli justice minister, uh, said that Palestine was an institute for the fumigation of Jewish vermin. Now, I mean, if you didn't know that, you would think that was a Nazi or a neo-Nazi who was saying that. Uh, and... Uh, this was the response. I mean, often when you listen to the Zionists, I mean, uh, Jacob Klatskin was another, uh, but I, I won't go through all of this. But in 19, but in 1954, there was the trial, or rather Rudolf Kastner. He was the leader of Hungarian Zionism. Uh, and he he came to an agreement with Adolf Eichmann in uh, April, May 1944. And the, the agreement was that if Eichmann agreed to allow a train for 600, it later expanded to 1,600 Jews out of Hungary, uh, they would say nothing about where the, the deportation trains were going and indeed would help in the roundups and the misinformation so in the Kalaj, the Kolosvar ghetto, uh, which is where Kastner was born, uh, the, the uh, helpers, the friends of Kastner, told the Jews that they were going to a fictitious place called Kenya Maze. Uh, and if they got on the trains early, they would get the best places. Well, of course, the trains were only headed for one direction, and that was Auschwitz. Uh, so the survivors of the Hungarian Holocaust came back uh, first to Hungary and then emigrated to Israel, and they demanded blood. They accused Kastner of being a collaborator with the Nazis, uh, which he was. There's no doubt about it at all whatsoever. And Kastner, who was a senior member of MAPAI, the Israeli Labour Party, was told by the Israeli state, he, he was a candidate for the next Knesset, that he must sue his detractors and the person he sued was a guy called Malchiel Greenwald. Uh, uh, and uh, at first, I mean, the judge recommended that Greenwald admits to having libeled Kastner and accept a small fine. But Greenwald was defended by a very articulate uh, right-wing Zionist, Shamul Tamir, and he caught Kastner out because Kastner had gone to Nuremberg to testify for a number of Nazi war criminals, although they only knew one at the Kastner trial. His name was Kurt Becher. He was the personal representative of Himmler, the, uh, the economic representative of Himmler in Hungary. His job was to asset strip Hungarian Jews of their wealth. And Kastner went to Nuremberg where Becher was being held uh, and he had him freed. He not only had him freed, it later turned out they had a whole number of other Nazis, including Hermann Krumi, uh, who was the deputy to Eichmann, who was in charge of the nuts and bolts of the Hungarian Holocaust. Uh, but uh, when this evidence was given and when he was caught out, the judge turned from being hostile to, if you like, the defense, to the defense, to being hostile to Kastner. And in a very famous verdict in 1955, Judge Benjamin Halevi said that Kastner had sold his soul to the devil. And this, this caused an absolute uproar in, in Israel, because don't forget, I mean, thousands of Holocaust survivors had gone there uh, and they were calling for Kastner's blood. Eventually, the verdict was overturned in the te legal technicality by the Supreme Court, but they accepted that Kastner was a collaborator and they accepted the facts as found by the lower court, the Jerusalem district court. And in fact, Kastner was assassinated in 1957, almost certainly by Shin Bet. Uh, there was a, a court case last year uh, when a retired colonel, I can't remember his name, uh, tried to get the files opened. Uh, but 
national security prevented it. Now, what kind of national security relates to files 60 years ago? It's quite clear that there was something to hide. Uh, the belief is that Castor was killed by the Israeli secret police, Shin Bet. Uh, now, you ask, uh, Steve, uh, a number of things. So, Hannah Arendt, uh, just one thing I have to say, yes, Hannah Arendt wrote a book about the trial. The trial, basically, the Eichmann trial, was intended to rehabilitate, uh, rehabilitate the Zionist leadership, which had been besmirched, as they saw it, by the Kastner trial. The legacy of the Kastner trial, the Supreme Court decision, was in 1958. The very fact that the decision was appealed caused the Israeli, the second Israeli government under Moshe Sharet to fall. So it, it was a major, major affair. You won't, the Zionists don't mention it now, but you can Google it. It's on Wikipedia and so on, if any of you are interested. Uh, but it, it was a major affair. So when the cast and the trial was intended to rehabilitate uh, the image of the Zionist leaders. Uh, and so anything to do with Kastner was kept out of the trial. Uh, one person, his friend, Andre Biss, who wanted to testify, was simply not allowed to uh, testify. The aim of the trial was, if you like, to adopt the Holocaust as Israel's own. Uh, and Hannah Arendt wrote this book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. And if you haven't got it, I do advise you to get it. It's a, it's a wonderful book. But the Zionists were absolutely outraged. Hannah Oren said, and I'll quote, and this is in her book, she said, the campaign against me was conducted with all the well-known means of image making and opinion manipulation. It got much more attention than the controversy. It was as though the pieces written against the book and more frequently against its author came out of a mimeographing machine. The clamour centred on the image of a book which was never written and touched upon the subject that often had not only not been mentioned by me, but had never occurred to me before. This is the kind of demonization I think many of us are quite familiar with from the Zionist lobby and the Zionist movement today. And Hannah Arendt was uh, attacked viciously uh, as a result. Steve, uh, the Zionist resistance. Uh, it's questionable what happened in the, it was the Bialystok uh, ghetto where Mordechai Tenenbaum Hamaroff was, but certainly in the the Warsaw ghetto, uh, Hashoma Hatzer played a part, uh, and its fighters fought alongside the Bund, the Communist Party, uh, and others. There is there is no doubt about that, uh, and uh, the fighters were at one with each other. I mean, there was no differences between them. I have to say that, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try and locate this uh, in my book, that you can just give me a few. Uh -huh. Let's say we've got two more uh, questions. So, All right, uh, okay. Carry on, look, uh, yes. concise as possible, please. Yes, of course. Uh, Okay, I, I will be concise. Basically, the Zionist fighters were, were told by their own movements in, in Palestine uh, that they shouldn't fight. They should go back to Palestine uh, because that was where they were needed. Uh, and this was a waste of their lives. Uh, and the main fight was against the Arabs, not Nazis. Uh, and one of these was Heike Klinger, uh, a resistance fighter in Betzin, Warsaw. Uh, and she, she went to Palestine in 1944 and she told the executive of Histadrut, which is the main Zionist colonizing agency, that uh, the various Jewish communities in Europe were headed by members of the Zionist movement. And most of them understood that the Nazis said, A, they would need to carry on and do B. And after they began assisting the Nazis to collect gold and furniture from Jewish homes, they had no choice but to go on to help them prepare lists of Jews for the labor camps. And precisely because those who stood at the heads of most of the communities were Zionists, 
the psychological effects on most of the Jewish masses vis-a-vis the Zionist idea was devastating and the hatred towards Zionism grew day by day. Uh, and, and Dan Porrett, who wrote a, a, a book about her and others, said members of the Zionist movement, Klinger believed, played a disproportionately large role in the leadership of European Jews. According to one post-war survey, two thirds of such leaders, this, this was of the Jewish councils, uh, were Zionist. And the writings of Klinger, of Zivia Lebetkin, uh, and a number of others who escaped, I think 33 fighters in all escaped through the sewers. Uh, when they came to Palestine, those that were Zionists, uh, their writings were changed, their memoirs were altered, their diaries were, were not printed, uh, and uh, they were simply reworded. Uh, and basically, you have to go back to the original source. Uh, because the copies that were printed uh, were simply propaganda and nothing more. Uh, so, yes, there was a Hashem Hatzair did play its part in Warsaw, but it was only able to do so because of the existence of the Bund. The Bund was a major organisation in the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, you asked about Lenny Brenner. Uh, yes, I, I, I do have differences. I mean, the article I wrote is in the Journal of Holy Land Studies. It was in 2014. Basically, Brenner's analysis comes from uh, Netta Ricarta and the Orthodox Jews, a Rabbi Weiss Mandel. Uh, I disagree with him. Weiss Mandel proposed a rescue plan called the Europa Plan, whereby for $2 million, they would bribe the Nazis to halting the Holocaust. Uh, that was an absurdity. The, the main figure who I relate to and is in my book is Rudolf Verber, who together with Alfred Wetzler escaped from Auschwitz in 2000 in, in, on April the 10th, 1944, and reached Slovakia uh, two weeks later. He and his fellow uh, escapee wrote the Auschwitz Protocols. And it was the Auschwitz Protocols which were given to Kastner at the end of April, and he suppressed them. They, they were the first first-hand account of Auschwitz. No one had known that Auschwitz was a, an extermination camp till then. Most people thought it was a large labour camp, because it was a labour camp as well. Auschwitz-Birkenau combined extermination and labour, and it had about 40 different branches. Uh, Lenny Brenner had never even heard of uh, Rudolf Verber. It's not mentioned once in this book. Uh, I know that because he told me he hadn't heard it uh, when he stayed with me. Uh, you may know that Jonathan Friedland, the appalling Zionist, uh, the Guardian, uh, has just written a book about Berber uh, as a, a Jewish hero. And uh, I would say that one of the reasons he chose to write a book about Berber was there were very few Zionist heroes that he could actually uh, write about. So, yes, I, I have some uh, disagreements with him. Verba and also Marek Edelman, who was the last commander of the Warsaw Ghetto, was simply erased from the Zionist history of the Holocaust by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Propaganda Museum in Jerusalem. They disappeared from history until they were resurrected very late in the day by Ruth Lynn, who's written an excellent book on escaping Auschwitz. So I hope that Thanks summarizes so it. <laughs> Thanks. For, that's the longest, longest answer, answer to a question. Oh, sorry. I've My ever heard. Anyway, it's nearly 25 past. Can I uh, get the two speaker uh, questioners to come in? Uh, Julian and then Andrew. Uh, I think Julian was first. So go on, Julian. And uh, I, I, I do ask you to keep it brief. <laughs> Sorry. But I think we can go on. I'll, I'll continue on after. Uh, we I'm can go happy. on a bit. Well, it's up to Steve, but some of us have to go and um, uh, do things uh, as well. Of course, Maybe. yes. <laughs> of <laughs> course. We've been out all day since 6.30. Come, uh, come on, Julian. Yeah, I think Tony will go on all night. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I did put a little question in the chat, but I wanted to ask something different, really. Um, I, I just, uh, I've only read the first couple of chapters of the book, but I just wondered uh, from, I mean, it's a wonderful thesis, um, and it's clear what, what the mission is. Um, I suppose I'm just looking a bit, outside of the mission. So are there socialist anti-Zionists 
uh, that you feel have a different position that you should engage with. Um, because uh, at the moment it's all polemic against um, what look like e increasingly uh, easy targets. Um, does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, Andrew, you ask your question, then Tony can uh, r respond. And if there's any more, get in quickly. Uh, and uh, if not, then after that, Tony responds and then sums up, and then we'll have the announcements. On, if there's Andrew. anyone else who wants to ask a question, I'm quite I, got any hand I can't see any hands up. All right, fine. But uh, anyway, Andrew, you're next. Go on. Floor's so, yours. Tony, <clears throat> what would you say to an American Christian Zionist, American Christian Zionist today? What would I say? Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few things, I imagine. <laughs> anyway, I think that's uh, over to you again, Tony. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any socialist anti-Zionists who have a different position to me? Yes, I, I, I'm sure there are. I mean, not every socialist anti-Zionist or every anti-Zionist would necessarily uh, agree uh, with my position. I know that the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, John Rose is their main theoretician, uh, would certainly not agree with me. He thinks it's an irrelevancy uh, uh, and has a different view of the role of the Zionists. So, but uh, I can't speak for the Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, I, I think a lot of, I mean, people have not thought about the question uh, and often avoid the question because it's very thorny. I mean, you you know, people who raise the question, like Ken Livingston did, are liable to be accused of anti-Semitism. So I think they're somewhat wary of that. Uh, what would I say to an American Christian Zionist? Uh, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I, I would say that... Uh, Jesus stood for justice, for peace, blessed are the meek, and so on. And here you are blessing the warmongers, those who would turn uh, the plows into swords, not the swords into plows, and that you really uh, stand uh, for, you really are the Antichrist in many ways. You are defending not the Christians in Palestine, uh, who are some of the most hearty fighters against the occupation. Uh, you know, in people like George Habash of the Demo of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and George Hawatmer of the Democratic Front, they were both uh, Christian. And the Christian villages in the West Bank have been amongst the forefront of those fighting the occupation and the oppression that Israel uh, visits on them. Uh, and that their failure to defend Christian communities in Palestine uh, is abhorrent and an outrage. Uh, and I'd also tell him that your belief in end times when the Jews would go to return, inverted commas, to uh, Palestine in order that they could then be consumed by fire in the battles of Armageddon is anti-Semitic. And that your whole uh, theology is an anti-Semitic one at heart. I hope that would Great. satisfy you. <clears throat> Great start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that that's David. Exactly. Sorry, if I may, if I may, yeah, go please, on. Yes, yeah, to, be, yeah, go on. If you don't quick. mind, sorry, sorry for this interruption. Be quick, be quick. We want to make yes, our yes. announcement. I, I would like to say something concerning uh, Tony's answer uh, with regard to my question, uh, uh, Tony. I didn't, I didn't speak about national movement. Okay, uh, uh, I spoke about nationalism. Why? Because you said, and this is very interesting for me, and so, and so, so I don't know. It's, it's a critical point here. Okay, you said that uh, uh, we have uh, you liken Israel with apartheid. If I'm not uh, yes, yes, I'm not wrong. So um, my question, okay, was uh, was uh, I, I was tried. Okay, okay to to make a connection there between apartheid and nationalism. So 
of course, national movement is a kind of historical phenomenon and so on, but nationalism for me, I'm a political scientist, okay? It's a kind of a political ideology. So the question was uh, as follows, okay, do you believe that uh, political Zionism was the basis for a kind of a political ideology, which is nationalism uh, for the Israel in order to, okay, to create a new kind of, uh, of, of, of nationalism. Uh, and um, um, in that sense, uh, I spoke about nationalism in order to, to understand if there is a connection there between uh, apartheid, Israel as an apartheid and the political ideology of nationalism, because we know that nationalism is a kind of aggressive okay, ideology and not, of course, for, for the national movement of, uh, uh, as you said, something like that. I hope that it makes sense. Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, it, it, it does make sense. Uh, I see political Zionism as, in essence, creating, I mean, it, it wanted to create a state like any other state. It believed, in a sense, in collective assimilation that Israel would be like any other state, but, of course, it wasn't because in the process of its form the process of its formation has determined its character uh, and Israel is on a path uh, to some form of Armageddon if you like with now the election of a uh, Ben Gavir and Smotrich and what I would call Jewish neo Nazis uh, to be quite honest uh, but yes I mean it was always nationalist but it was a nationalism of the oppressor uh, it, it, I, I wouldn't call it a, a national movement, but yes, it was nationalist, without a doubt. I, ho I hope that makes it clear. Uh, it belonged to a whole series of European nationalist movements, which weren't mm. national movements, but were incredibly reactionary. Christian nationalist movements in Romania and in Hungary, uh, in Slovakia, in Croatia, all the places where Jews died in very large numbers in the Holocaust, incidentally. Uh, it was an ethno-nationalism, if you like, uh, which is not the same. Uh, I hope that's satisfactory. Thanks for We can that. discuss this some other yeah. time since you're in Brighton anyway. <laughs> yes, I think that thanks, might thanks be a, it's very I interesting. Thanks that, a lot. I think that can, I just say, <laughs> can I just say, finally, I put, I'll put again my email in the yeah. chat. If you do want to uh, yeah, get a copy of the book, then just email me okay thanks a lot thank you uh thank you tony i think you've summed up now is that right uh, yes yes that's know? fine well uh, that was great i mean it got, got a lot of discussion going and obviously people want to go on but uh we don't want to go on too far i've still got we've still got about 40 people online but we do tend to wrap up at 8 30. sure sure uh steve steve's got steve's got things to do and so have i and uh etc etc and uh and we are losing people at quite a rapid rate. So I want to bring Francis in now to talk about the journal, and then I'll bring Steve in to speak briefly about how you can join the SHS and how you can uh, uh, attend our net future meetings, because we have got a great one coming up with Greg, Professor Gregory Clays uh, in February on uh, utopianism in a di for a dying planet. I think that that's probably not the title of it, but it's something similar to that. Anyway, Francis, do you want to come in now if you're still, if you're still here? I'm still, I'm, I'm still here. Can you hear you're me? still here. Yeah, yeah you, the floor is yours. Am I audible? Yes. Excellent. No, I, I just wanted to announce that uh, some of you might have been wondering what's happened to the second issue of Socialist History for 2022. I'm expecting delivery of it tomorrow and uh, we'll be sending it out um, together with renewal reminder notices. So those of you who have not renewed your membership for 2023 uh, will also be getting a little reminder to do so. I've put in the chat the uh, um, web address for uh, joining the Social Security Society online. So anybody who isn't a member of the society but will be interested in joining, uh, please uh, click on that link and click on the PayPal thing and you'll be in and you'll get two copies of the journal and two uh, pamphlets we produce uh, uh, for your year's membership. That's basically what I wanted to let people know. 
Thank you, Francis. Uh, Steve, have you got anything to say about the uh, next meeting, how to join the SHS, or are you going to put that up on the, on the uh, screen? Yeah. Or whatever? Uh, the, uh, the next meeting is entitled Utopianism for a Dying Planet, Life Under Consumerism, How the Utopian Tradition Offers Answers to Today's Environmental Crisis. Uh, That's speaker will be great. Speaker will be Greg Gregory Place. It's on the 23rd of February. It's online. If you go to the Socialist History website, uh, which is Socialist History Society.co.uk, uh, uh, you'll find that uh, you'll find that on there. You will also find on the website how to join the Socialist History Society, uh, which uh, Francis has just announced. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, you can join through the website. Uh, I shall uh, be putting the, uh, uh, the recording of this meeting up on the website by the beginning of next week. I shall send an email round to those who registered, uh, 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 listing that, and I will also include in that links to the next meeting, links to how to join, and links to how to get Tony's book. Uh, Fantastic. So uh, 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 that's uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. And I think with that we can close the uh, meeting. I don't, I don't, I don't see how I should uh, stick around anymore. John, John Walker's got his hand up. You, John, I'll let you in. I know you've been. A, I was just waving goodbye. Oh right, okay. But you, you unmuted yourself as well, so I assumed that you wanted to speak. Anyway, thanks. To, nice to hear from you, John. However brief it was. Uh, thanks, everyone. That is the meeting over, as far as I'm right. concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, very much. Tony. Good luck yeah. with the book. Bye. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Thanks Bye. a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. Stick with us.